This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. When a guard would stop and talk to you, you used to stand back and you would yell so people could hear what you were saying to that guard as they walked by or, or within the vicinity. But he knew what a convict was going to do before they thought of it themselves. themselves. he just been around that long and uh, he was tough. They'd find uh, Sparky in about every conceivable place you could imagine, which we would, of course, dump. They'd wait until everybody was locked up, and he would open his door, run down to cell one, and get a bugler can full of Sparky and take it back to his cell. She had a kind of a hypnotic power. There were a great many wild cats around the penitentiary, and most people couldn't get near them. But she would stand in the doorway of the cell house and say, kitty, 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 and those cats would go to her. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Stool Pigeon Saturday. Today, Sky and I have a special guest, Samuel Anderson, here to talk about some sports and some that he has a personal connection to. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you for having me, Anthony. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, first off, can you introduce yourself? Uh, where are you from? What are you doing here? Why do you love boxing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I um, grew up in East Idaho. I um, am Idaho born and raised. In fact, my uh, grandparents farm potatoes, as, as is the tradition <laughs> in a lot of Idaho. I uh, first got into boxing when I was in high school. I fought for the Titan Gym out of Idaho Falls for a few years. And then I competed with the Fort Hall Boxing Gym, um, which I believe was called Eagle Hawk at the time. And then in recent years, I, I moved to Boise to get a degree at Boise State University. And since then, I've been um, with Combat Fitness SBG, uh, Straight Blast Gym. Wait, how long have you been there? Uh, in Boise or in the gym? No, at, at SBG. SBG, oh, I've been here as long as I've been in Boise, so about four or five years. Did you teach boxing classes? No, I'm I'm one of the competitors. I'm not a coach. Oh, <laughs> I gosh. Okay, I took, um, I did for the year that I was home between my master's and my uh, PhD, I, I trained out there and just, I was actually going to start training for like an amateur fight with Daniel, and then I broke my wrist. So were you training to do boxing, Sky? Yeah. That's super awesome. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dan- Daniel, of course, is my boxing coach. So Daniel was in the ring with me just a couple of weeks ago. He's so great. I like learned so much from him. And because I grew up playing soccer, like, you know, hand to hand combat sort of stuff is not my thing. But, you know, and he works, works his his boxers hard. But like, he is so good at what he does. And I actually today at the gym, we have a bag hanging up. And I was like, I haven't actually boxed in forever. But I just want to go like, hit the bag and like, kind of get back into it a little bit felt really good. So that's, that's funny that there's a connection there. Such a small world. Yeah, yeah I had no idea, Sky. That's that's really exciting. Yeah. yeah, the um, you have to have a level of faith and trust in your coaches with boxing that you might not necessarily have with other sports, just because you kind of you're putting yourself in their hands, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's tough when you're fighting because after you take a few hits, you're just you're not quite able to make the same decisions <laughs> as cognitively as as you can outside. It's it's often you know when they stop fights, the fighter and I've experienced this myself. The first thing you say is I'm fine. Like why are we yeah. stopping the fight? I can keep going. And that's why it's so important for the refs, the doctors, and of course your coaches to be able to make those bigger calls and be like, know when you can keep going and know how hard you can push yourself while trying to keep you safe at the same time. And so to have people like Daniel Marin out there that you can just put a lot of trust in, who's just a good, solid coach, makes a big difference for fighters. That's very cool. Yeah, I agree. I I really want to get back into it, but too busy reading books right now so <laughs> and, and <laughs> maybe if i come back to the treasure valley i'll, I'll uh, you know hit up sbg again because i really enjoyed it for me it's like a good way to get aggression out but also to think i think um and you know i think we can talk about this with the the prison boxing as well that it's it's not just about going in there and just like trying to beat the crap out of your opponent it's so much skill and it takes such critical thinking in a way that like 
I think a lot of other sports don't have. And so, you know, you have to be disciplined in it, um, which I think is why it's such an important sport, you know, within prison. It shows that these, you know, inmates who are in have actually a great amount of discipline. And, and if they only applied it when they were outside, you know, they would be very successful. But I don't want to step on step on your toes in terms of, of the story. So, No, that, that was a great introduction and, and kind of great to, to explore some of those themes that we're going to talk about today. Well, why don't you enlighten us about the history of prison boxing here at the Idaho State Penitentiary? All right. So this this is my research that I did um, mostly focused on looking back and trying to get the big picture of the fighting. And so a lot of it was data work. And I'm going to talk about that a lot, a lot of numbers, just because that was kind of the way I thought would be the best idea to get those overall arcing pictures. You know, real quick, I'll go through my sources. I, Wall City Bolton, The Clock, Idaho Statesman, uh, The Warden's Biennial Report, Thomas Reese's Oral History, of course, and then kind of outside of that, looking more at uh, boxing's overall history and, of course, brain damage, the National Association of Ringside Physicians, Britannica, Team USA Amateur Boxing, uh, Dementia.org, and the American Journal of Sports Medicine. So moving on, the big thing with the prison is there is basically three major eras. That's going to be the easiest way to kind of catalog and look at the history of boxing here in the prison. There was the controversial era, the in-house era, and then finally the amateur era. Now, the first time period is the controversial era which took place in the 1890s, and um, this one we have the most limited information on, due in part to the time period and due in part to the scandalous nature of boxing at the time. This is also the boxing era you've talked about the most on the podcast, so I don't feel that it's necessary that we devote the most time to it today. But just as a quick reminder to your audience, our first record of fighting at the Idaho Penitentiary begins on September 8th, 1890. This is when the Idaho statesman broke the first story detailing these controversial fights. This is what that first fiery article had to say about those events. Quote, investigate the matter. In the local columns of the statesman, the tale of brutal prize fighting is told as occurring at the penitentiary where all the necessary adjuncts of brutal professional of pugnalism were present admitting that the story told is absolutely true and unexaggerated, there is no particular sympathy to be expressed for the human bulldog contesting. <laughs> yeah, That's pretty, great. pretty intense. <laughs> um, now, were they, were they fighting with gloves or was this bare knuckle? So from what we can tell from the Idaho statesman, it, it claimed that they were using gloves. And the quality of those gloves, it's hard to imagine they were good quality. <laughs> In this era, it was very typical for boxing gloves to be made out of leather and filled with horse hair. And that was usually the padding used for boxing gloves. But it was it was pretty dangerous and uh, it was high risk for your hands. Um, human hands just aren't really meant to punch each other with. <laughs> the scandal would cause contention among locals and, of course, spur on a full investigation. And then, of course, the Idaho statesman reported on this on September 13th, 1891, in an article called Investigation in Progress. It reads as follows, quote, The governor stated that the evidence introduced went to show that no prize fight had occurred, that boxing had been practiced frequently, and that the contest in question was simply a boxing match between two convicts with pillows on their hands and that no one was hurt. In answer to questions, he stated that the investigation had not included any charges of drinking, but if any allegation was made that the guards had been guilty of drunkenness on duty, a rigid investigation would be held, unquote. So between the accusations of prize fights, drinking, and gambling, the prison was in some pretty hot water. Warden W.S. Matt came to the defense by saying that the previous wardens had allowed inmate fighting with the use of boxing gloves, uh, referred to here in this article as quote-unquote pillows. <laughs> However, despite this explanation, this scandal added one of the contributing factors which would lead to Warden Mack's removal from his position. Very little documentation remains depicting these events. It's easy to suspect that these were pretty disorganized affairs. <laughs> 
So I do think it's important to stop here for a moment to talk about the history of boxing and the contributing factors to why this was such a scandal in the Boise community. So hand-to-hand fighting has existed for as long as humans have had large-scale society. Uh, We don't have a lot of evidence in it with hunter and gather societies. But we do have boxing's early roots going as far back as Mesopotamia and Egypt. However, just in respect to everyone's time, I'm going to skip a few thousand years <laughs> and bring us to modern, the modern era. At the very tail end of the bale knuckle movement, boxing was beginning to gain mass popularity in Britain. However, in the United States, the sport was far more controversial, which I think is demonstrated here by the Idaho statesman condemnation of the fight. Because of this, many states outlawed the sport, causing it to go underground in the country. Boxing, as a result, was poorly regulated and often quite dangerous. The round system and weight classes had been established in England at this time, but were poorly enforced, and it was even worse in the underground fighting in North America. I don't personally know that the boxing events that occurred at the prison during the 1890s were malicious in intent, They were most uncertainly unsafe to the participants. Boxing at its best is dangerous, and the conditions here in the 1890s were undeniably not its best. I think part of the issue that is coming up in the article is not necessarily that boxing is dangerous and brutal, because it absolutely is. And and most reformers would absolutely say, like, we need to get rid of this because it is violent. But a lot of progressive reformers, because 1890s, right at the start of the progressive era, they are more concerned with, and I think we saw this in the, the article, the gambling and the drinking and sort of the the working class association that boxing had that it was dangerous morally, if not physically, that like, for example, like Teddy Roosevelt, he loved sports, he loved boxing, he didn't object to boxing on the grounds that it was violent, um, especially in the bare knuckle era, but he was more opposed to it that like, men would go and the crowd was rowdy, they were drinking, money was being exchanged. And so that was, I think, what part of the reason that this was such a scandal as well is like, of course, it was dangerous. And if you sort of have quote unquote, pillows on your hands, like it's it's not going to be any safer than if you just were to bare knuckle box each other. But there was such a an issue around the morality of boxing in terms of the gambling and drinking aspect of it as well. So that's a very, very good point, Sky. You know, with with the boxing, um, Obviously, modern boxing does have gambling, drinking, that, that that kind of is the crowd it draws. And you have to remember the boxing of this era, it was underground. So I'm sure those things were even more exaggerated than you might see today in kind of that more controlled environment. So you're absolutely right. I think the morality of that type of environment probably is factoring into this controversy. Boxing at the prison came to its end with the departure of Warden Mack, and the sport would be banned for almost the next 40 years inside the prison. By the 20s, attitudes about boxing had changed in the United States. Due to its profitability, global appeal, use in combat training, as well as its ability to represent a nation's athletic dominance, the United States caught the fighting fever. And Sky, I'm sure you've been reading all about that transition. <laughs> that nationwide change can be seen in the prison as well. Uh, Warden Wheeler lifted the ban on fighting in 1927. The warden's biennial report states, quote, Boxing is permitted during the leisure times, as we find the manly art builds up the weaklings, adds to his stores of courage, and tends to make the once inebriated anemic, bloodless youth into a manly fellow, capable of protecting himself without resorting to the use of a weapon. Unquote. During the same year, we also saw one of the first official boxing events. On May 31st, as a Memorial Day celebration, was reported by the Idaho Statesman. Quote, prisoners stage program. Prisoners at the Idaho State Penitentiary were treated to a diversified program Monday. It is the custom, Warden J.W. Wheeler says, to let the prisoners arrange a program of their own for any holiday, and Wednesday they gave an impromptu minstrel show, had two boxing matches, and a battle royale. This was followed by a varied musical program by the prisoners and a skirl on the bagpipes by William McLeod. 
who accompanied the members of the Salvation Army to the penitentiary for services. End quote. Yeah, it makes you imagine what that event would have been like. I love the the bagpipes. (laughs) Minstrel show, bagpipes, some boxing. What's the Battle Royale? Was so I I had to look this up. A Battle Royale is usually a fight that has more than one person. I was going to say it's that intense, yeah. where like it's like yeah. a, a a whole ring full of boxers and then whoever falls down. <laughs> Sounds like wrestling. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what that would have looked like. You know, the 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 only there's a couple of mentions of Battle Royales in the early in the Wall City Journal, it's hard to know what those even would have looked like because there's not a lot of description given. But I'm pretty sure it was one of those things where it was like literally last man standing, which yeah. I cannot even imagine how absolutely exhausting that would be. Yeah, it's in um, <laughs> the Battle Royales in the later years of the prison. There's more details of the early ones, whether this was boxing or wrestling or some combination of the both. And if it was last man standing, which it seems to be, it's it's kind of hard to know all of the details. There's a little <laughs> bit of mystery involved. I wonder if that was a way to like let all of the inmates just get all of their frustrations out. Like it was sort of a semi-regulated way to be like, are you mad about something? Go in there and figure it out. You know what I mean? Like just get all of that tension out. And that way you don't have to like set up scheduled matches. You can just be like, all right, good luck, everyone. Like a little purge in the ring. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's That's a truly good question. Of course, one of the biggest celebrities to visit the old Idaho penitentiary was Jack Dempsey. Um, You both are familiar with Dempsey, of course. Oh, I didn't know he visited the pen. Yeah, Yeah, he did. Um, And for your fans, Dempsey, for those of you who do not know, was the heavyweight champion from 1919 to 1926, which, by the way, is still the longest any fighter has ever held the title. Wow. The history of boxing blazes with names like Sullivan, Leonard, Johnson, Ross, and other great champions. But in boxing's role of honor, none stands above those of Jack Dempsey and Joe Lewis. The date, July 4th, 1919. The heavyweight champion of the world, a hulking man named Jess Willard. The challenger, Jack Dempsey. The first thing I recollect is seeing Big Jess stand over the corner, looked in great shape and very confident. I didn't know whether I was going to be in a fight or a foot race. I mean, I thought I was going to knock him out in the first round. But after seeing him, I I thought I'd better fight for my life. And fight for his life he did, winning the title in one of the most spectacular bouts of all time. In 1927, a prize fight gripped the imagination of the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, main event, 10 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world. Introducing from Salt Lake City, Utah, Wearing black trunks, weighing 187 and a half pounds, former heavyweight king, Jack Dempsey. That was the famous long count when Tunney got off the canvas, was still standing when the fight ended. After the fight, Dempsey said, Well, my thoughts was and hoping he would never get up, but unfortunately he did. And won the fight, and more power to him. A great boy and a great champion. Tunney's comment. In spite of the fact that I was hit seven times in succession in the seventh round in my contest with Jack Dempsey for the world's heavyweight championship, was one of my luckiest nights. As a matter of fact, the luckiest night of my life. Before Dempsey, one of the most stylish of the champions was Gentleman Jim Corbett. When I was 17 years old, I was the amateur heavyweight champion of the Pacific Coast. And nine years after that, I won the heavyweight championship of the world. And it only shows what a boy can do when he just takes care of himself. So it was actually towards the end of Dempsey's fighting career, he had an exhibition fight at the Boise Fairgrounds. He actually offered to fight any local who dared to step in the ring with him. And there were 6,000 in attendance. Uh, (laughs) Ian and I actually looked this up. That was one of the biggest fighting events that have ever been held in Idaho. Oh, I bet. That's crazy. Only five men out of those 6,000 were brave enough to accept the challenge. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Well, how long was that line? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Not as long as I was thinking. 
Dempsey got in the ring with the first contender and immediately put the poor fellow on his back. <laughs> oh, jeez. The second followed suit, the third, the fourth, the fifth. Dempsey lined them all up and knocked them all out. Wow. All five fights only came to a grand total of 12 minutes and 59 <laughs> seconds in the ring. Wow. Th- this is one of those truly bizarre pieces of history uh, and something you'd never see today. <laughs> yeah. the, the idea of like, it's, it's almost like a circus act. Oh, like, yeah. Step up and... and Test your boxing. I love the audacity of the men who were like, oh, I can totally beat the heavyweight champion of the world. Absolutely. Oh, my God. You have to to almost feel bad for how naive they are. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the line was like 20 people long, and then after those first five got knocked out, you know, it started to dwindle after that. Or I wonder if some of it was just like the fact that they could be like, I've literally been in a ring with Jack Dempsey, like knowing they're going to get knocked out, but just to be able to like say that yeah totally. oh absolutely it would be a, a a good thing to brag about at a bar um mm-hmm. i believe it was the fourth or maybe the fifth competitor that night was actually a local fighter oh, and he yeah. actually waited to go as the last fighter in hopes that those first few fights had worn off dempsey and apparently that was the the best fight of the evening but it's still i believe that one was still less than 60 yeah. seconds yeah um, so while we're not actually sure why Dempsey visited the Idaho Penitentiary, we do know that he did because of those photos with um, him posing with Warden R.E. Thomas. Which, Anthony, you're going to have to post afterwards. Yeah, they're so cool. Really, Such a, really like neat. a bizarre collection. I remember coming across him and being like, what? Why is he here? Like, it's well, so strange. And Dempsey was described as being really friendly. Yeah. And, and you just, you get that in those pictures. Oh, totally, yeah. So, between 1936 and 1940, the Idaho Penitentiary held 13 boxing matches with 101 confirmed fighters. This, of course, would be the second era, the in-house era. All matches would take place inside the prison, all fights would be inmate versus inmate, and these events often took place on holidays and would range somewhere between about six to nine bouts. The men at the beginning of this event would fight three three-minute rounds, and then the rounds would increase gradually with each additional fight. The main event would consist of anywhere from five to eight three-minute rounds. I realize that is a lot of numbers that might not necessarily mean much to someone who's not familiar with the sport. To give some context, modern amateur boxing is typically three two-minute rounds. In professional fights for championships or belts, there will often be 15 three-minute rounds, or they were originally. Of course, this was later changed to 12 three-minute rounds after it was discovered that the worst brain damage and the most common cases of death would happen in those last three rounds. The fact that inmates were fighting five to eight is about what you could expect to see for low-scale pro fights today. And that's pretty serious fighting for people who were unpaid professionals. Think of the fitness to... And of course, with each additional round, you raise the chances of being knocked out. Just because of the fatigue, um, you're you're no longer able to defend yourself. So a lot of times, those big fights, that's that's what you're hoping for, is a big knockout at some point. Uh The fitness and the damage you would take within that many rounds, I can't even imagine what these inmates or these early boxers went through. What's kind of the typical weight now of gloves? Do you get into that? Typically, amateur boxing gloves are about 10 to 12 ounces. They actually have Velcro design usually, and amateur gloves are made to absorb shock. Okay. Um, Pro gloves are about 8 to 10 ounces. They're laced, and they're typically designed to do damage. There's actually, the pro gloves are a lot harder. And um, one of the advantages of those harder gloves is it's easier to cut. Uh-huh. And so with pros, you see those like big cuts over the eyebrows or cheeks. That's actually the the, the toughness of the glove that's doing that. Huh. Um, just in comparison, MMA gloves are about 4 ounces. The fact that we have that separation between pro and amateur gloves in which amateur gloves are meant to absorb and and pro are meant to damage, in the 1930s there probably wasn't that, that separation. I imagine these gloves would have been more similar to modern amateur gloves, but the padding and the support system just 
was not great and it often would cause cause injuries. Bad gloves and poor regulation led to a lot of injuries and many technical knockouts. In fact, in just one event on September 8th, 1936, we had two different fighters break their wrists. Oh, man. Yeah. While fighters were attempted to be paired with fighters in the same weight class, sometimes the difference could be up to 30 pounds. Wow. Um, which, of course, is, is illegal nowadays. Uh, a weight difference that big, you run, you run a serious risk of killing someone. Yeah, what's, what's the legal weight distance now? So, so it kind of depends. Typically, for amateur, it's, it's within five pounds. Five pounds. Um, wow. For a high, like a title fight, either amateur or pro, um, you have to be like within a pound. Okay. And so um, it's it's a lot, lot closer. And, um, of course, this causes the, the tradition of, of weight cuts, um, doing, doing big weight cuts in order to try and match each other's weight as perfectly as possible. I imagine fighters in the prison had to do that later on. Um, uh. During this area, obviously, they were not trying that hard to get them matched to the weights. Gotcha. Uh, the, the, the differences could be pretty big, and if, if you don't have to cut weight for a fight, why would you? And with your own experience, have you fought with somebody who's been above your weight? Yeah, so um, typically in sparring, um, it's very common to put big guys with little guys and little guys with big guys. Okay. The reason why is the big guys get to practice their speed. They get to fight with someone who's a lot faster than them. The little guys get to throw knockout shots. Ah. Um, you can throw knockout shots to a bigger guy and it won't drop them. For a while, I trained with Golden Gloves champion uh, Jeremy Bronco, who fights for Fort Hall, and uh, he was he was about two forty, and so he was outweighing me about fifty or sixty oh, pounds by the time, and so um, it gave me a chance to to throw harder than I could in that training environment with someone my own size. Okay. As far as actual fights go, all of my fights have been within pretty close weight of each other. I, of course, have fought a few guys that are bigger than me, and I've had to fight a few guys that are smaller than me that had to do pretty big weight cuts. Um, as you know, my last fight I had, I had to do a pretty substantial weight cut, and, and it was hard. Yeah. Um, you run a risk, especially when you're doing a big weight cut uh, of just losing a little bit of strength you you lose strength and power if you have to go way far down to to fight someone and if you do a weight cut too quick too fast which is mostly focused at that point on dehydration you run a serious risk to doing pretty bad damage to your kidneys yeah how much did you cut for your last fight yeah i i don't know that i should publicly admit this oh. but it was um you know my my last fight i i got offered it the week of and i had five days to lose 16 pounds 16 pounds in five days wow and out of you know years and years of fighting um years of cutting weight years of training you know hard training hard sparring that weight cut was one of the most miserable things i ever did yeah. um that week when I, I sparred the last spar before the fight, I was like, I'm going to pass out. I'm just so dehydrated. Because yeah. getting, getting that dehydrated is, is just unreal. You can't, you can't swallow your spit. Your eyes are dry. It, it affects your body in a lot of ways. Yeah. And um, everyone asked me if I was hungry because uh, obviously I'd cut food as well. But uh, no, you, when, when you're cutting that much water, you don't even think about food. Food's... <laughs> The last thing on your mind, all that you can think about is water. That's insane. The, the amount of mental strain and physical strain and dedication to get to that level, that's, that's really impressive. That's crazy. <laughs> well, and that was kind of a unique situation just because it was kind of a last-minute offer for the fight. Yeah. Typically, what would happen is you get offered about a month out, and you have about 14 weeks to lose 16 pounds or you know, 15 right. pounds or whatever. Yeah. And that's that's very doable. Yeah. You know, if you have four weeks to do it, you know, you just manage your food, cut back, and then that final week you cut the water. And um, it's, it's, it's tough and it takes a lot of discipline, but it's not like that kind of desperate. And, and honestly, it was kind of a fool's errand on my part. That's something I, I would not recommend to other fighters <laughs> yeah. or other people because weight cuts that big are dangerous. Yeah. And, and I, I don't want to be giving giving your audience the wrong ideas to to make them do something like that because uh it i knew it was a risk but it was a fight that i wanted and i was willing to take that risk yeah, for that yeah. fight 
In 2021, the Idaho State Historical Society is celebrating 140 years of service to Idahoans as the trusted source in protecting Idaho's historical places and artifacts and sharing its stories. As a part of the commemoration, the Old Idaho Penitentiary is committed to bringing you 140 unique stories about the people who worked, lived, and served time at the site through this podcast and the events and programs scheduled throughout the year. The Capturing 140 Storytelling Program offers a unique glimpse at lives filled with hope and despair and the enduring triumphs and tragedies at Idaho's only penitentiary from 1872 to 1973. Stay tuned. What was your favorite sport? Boxing. Did you learn it uh, before you came here? You I boxed here? a little bit before I came here, but when I was here, Don, a guy named Don Schoonover, he was a dude in life sentence, he was a pro boxer. He'd take me on the sand shop every day with just work gloves every five days a week. Sand shop? Yeah, it's called the sand shop out there. And uh, he beat the hell out of me every day with just work gloves on. Just, just teaching me how to box. <laughs> he didn't do a lot of things. He taught me how to take a punch. Then Morton Mays left boxing, come in here. And a guy named Del Trumbo, and he came out here. And that's when this place, everybody was afraid to come out in here. And he trained a bunch of us. He'd get in the ring and he'd fight every one of us. He's the president of the Idaho Golden Gloves Association and stuff for years. And he was a referee at most of our fights downtown and, and in other, other towns and states too. So the fact that all of these boxing events where inmates fighting other inmates could sometimes result in multiple rematches. Mm. Notably, Red Isles and Battling Moreno had three fights against each other. I can't even imagine what type of bad blood these rivals would have created. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the prison was able to make some revenue off these events. Uh, Outsiders were allowed to come into the prison to watch the fights, but the fights were only open to men and boys. Admission was 85 cents. So, let's play you and Sky's favorite game. In 1938, how much money would 85 cents be in modern currency? Gosh, I'm so bad at this. I feel like tw- I'm going to say 20. 20 dollars? 20 bucks. I was going to say about 10. If you take the average of you two, you're about there, oh. um, which is, is pretty impressive that you guys can guess that. It was about $16.34. Damn. Um, I checked a couple of websites. Uh, the cents kind of changed a little bit yeah. depending on which one you used, but it was always somewhere on 16 going to 17. Okay. Would you say that's about where we're at now with yeah, matches? it's it's very common for about uh, 15 to 20 bucks for either an amateur mm-hmm. or a pro fight. And nice. um, amateur boxing is all non-profit, and so they actually make all of their money from the boxers' um, families who come and, and watch and the fans who come and watch. That's cool. Jiu-jitsu or, or other different types of fighting tournaments, you have to pay to compete. Mm. Um, in boxing, you have to pay to be licensed, but you don't have to pay tournament fees. Okay. Um, which has its advantages and disadvantages, but that's one of the reasons why they charge so much nowadays is just as a way to kind of sustain the program. Uh-huh. So this was one fact that I thought you would like a lot, is the a tradition of having a comedy bout in the boxing <laughs> matches. Uh, This was originally the first fight of the event and would consist of two or more men fighting each other in the ring under humorous circumstances, such as being blindfolded or having their legs tied together in order to hop around the ring. This fight, of course, was not really a fight at all, and it was just supposed to warm up the audience and allow for a few laughs before that real boxing could begin. I know I've covered a lot of historical detail, and while they are important to the story, what they what they lack is the flavor. It does not show the excitement of the audience, the nervousness of the fighters, the blood on the canvas being mopped off in between fights, the devastation of defeat and the high of victory. So I felt it would only be right to get to hear what an actual inmate wrote about these fights. This is an article written for the prison newspaper, which at the time was the Wall City Bulletin in 1939, This was released in July, but it's actually about the June boxing event. Um, While the writer is not actually credited, I have some confidence it was written by Bud, who was the news reporter for sports at the prison at that time. Here's what he had to say about the event. 
The Memorial Day fight card was the best production here in more than a year. Responsibility for this improvement is due to the efforts of Dunk, who is really developing some good fighters. A comedy bout between Guy and Morgan opened the card. This was one of those things that which each man was supplied with gloves on one hand and a tin pie plate in the other for sound effects. The problem was to hammer away with the tin plates to get the range and then swing wildly. The boys got a draw without a solid blow having been struck. <laughs> now, skipping ahead a little bit to the actual fighting. Four rounds, Wilson 180 versus Free 185 pounds. In this fight, Free really upset the apple cart. He went into the ring with the odds against him to win and all the bets on Wilson to take the scrap by a KO. After absorbing all Wilson had in the first round and getting nothing more than a bloody nose, Free's confidence began to show itself. By the last of the second, it appeared that he could weather the storm and he came out with a draw in what provided a good fight. Going a little further. Six rounds, Baker 160 pounds versus Ellis 160 pounds. This was a rematch. The first meeting of these fast boys happened having ended in a win for Ellis on February 22nd. Lots of leather was pushed around in the first round and the boys kept up the fast pace throughout the fight. Both seemed willing to mix it up and each were determined to get it over with as soon as possible. Early in the bout, Baker outloosed with a vicious right uppercut that dropped Ellis and somersaulted him over backwards. He was on his feet without a count, and both boys were at it again. Hammer and tongs, seeding rounds were a repetition of the first, and neither man showing any indication of slowing up. Ellis's shiftiness and his forcing the fighting finally won him the nod. Baker bled continuously after the second round and had suffered a broken nose. This was one swell fight. <laughs> then finally, eight rounds main event. Raf 198 pounds and Edward 192 pounds. Raf went up against a boy who is underrated in most everyone's opinion. Edward's chances lay in his ability to hit with the right to the body and to wear a raft down. And he was nearly did just that. Edward took five of the first six rounds and set such a pace that Raff realized at the beginning of the seventh that his only chance was a KO. For the first minute of the seventh, Raff waited his chance, finally landing a right that put Edward down for a nine count. Seconds later, he floored Edward for the full count. And that was that. <laughs> Unquote. So... In 1941 until 1969 were what could be considered the quiet years for fighting in the penitentiary. Whether fighting was banned or simply put on hold is unclear, but what is likely impacted was the war efforts and the views of the current warden. What is clear is little to no boxing events took place here for the next three decades. However, this is not to say boxing was not on the minds and hearts of the inmates here in the prison. Boxing news was a popular topic and was often included in the prison newspaper, The Clock, which you often mention in the podcast. The Clock even featured a section dedicated just to boxing news called The Squared Circle. As you often talk about with prison life, prison does not take place in an airlock. Inmates are well aware and interested in the events in the outside world. A great example of this is prisoners writing about Joe Lewis. Now, do either of you know anything about Joe Lewis? I know the name. I don't know much beyond that. I know that he was quite a, a legendary figure. Yeah. Joe, Joe Lewis was, was an early figure in boxing's history and, and just an incredible fighter. Uh, th this is me admitting some historical bias here. I, I grew up with a poster of Joe Lewis on my wall. He, he, just, he was a really incredible man and had a very interesting story. He was the second African-American heavyweight champion of the world, and he was a very controversial figure in his day. After fighting against Max Smeling, who was the Nazi prize fighter, the two fighters became symbolic of the racial tensions at the time. Smeling is down! Smeling is down! The count is four! It's, and he's up! And Lewis 
right and left to the head, a left to the jaw, a right to the head, and Donovan is watching carefully. Lewis measures him, right to the body, a left hook to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The count is five, five, six, seven, eight. The men are in the ring. The fight is over on a technical knockout. Max Schmeling is beaten in one round. The first time that a world's heavyweight championship ever changed hands in one round. And that's a very long, complicated story. I I recommend you look into it if you're interested in boxing history. Max Schmeling himself was actually not a Nazi. He um, was actually privately very against the Nazi party. His manager, um, in fact, believed in the Jewish religion, and, and that was one of the contributing factors to Max's complicated relationship with the Nazi party, but Hitler just loved Max Schmeling wow. and very much promoted him as like the ideal the ideal human, really. And um, so when Max and Lewis fought each other, a lot of those tensions carried over through the rest of the world. Yeah. Despite how racially charged this subject was, inmate Bill Hicks was unafraid to give his opinion on the fighter. Bear with me, Bill had a few typos. I realize that all fight fans have what they think was the, and perhaps they are right. But for my dough, Joe Lewis was the greatest. He was a clean fighter, and he always gave his opponents credit for being good. He was generous, giving to charity, and drew no line. Regardless of race, color, or creed, or size, he fought them all. He was a skillful boxer, a good puncher, and an all-round good sport. Unquote. Boxing news, however, was not the only thing prisoners wrote about in the clock. Prisoners also drew pictures, they wrote story, they discussed fighting history, they made comics, and they even wrote poetry about the sport. This was the era in which the United States saw a boxing on the rise, quickly becoming one of the most popular sports in the country. This can be seen through the 33 men who composed 77 different documents about boxing during these 30 years. By the end of the 60s, boxing had returned for the amateur era, its final and most serious stage here in the prison. Gone were the days of unorganized brawls. Now were the days of serious training. For starters, the program got more official coaches and managers from outside of the prison to work with inmates. Fighters fought in relatively stricter weight classes, big quotations over relatively, (laughs) and they were more likely to do three three three-minute rounds. Perhaps most important, inmates had less fights with other inmates, but now would compete as part of USA amateur boxing against other competitors. In order to box, and especially to travel to box, inmates needed to gain a higher trustee status. Whenever I get asked why the prison had sports programs, I always try to bring this up. Sports were a great way to reward and punish inmates. However, despite the good behavior you have to compete in these sports, we did see a few inmates get in trouble in these outside (laughs) events. Uh, For example, Larry Ortega in 1927, on February 26, while competing at a boxing event at Bishop Kelly High School, decided that instead of trying to test his fighting ability, he was going to test his running ability. (laughs) But his escape was pretty short-lived, and he was recaptured six days later. Now, there had to have been an escape story in here. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and Larry Ortega, um, he's kind of a complicated figure. You know, it's, it's easy to see him as the runner, but he actually had a really good boxing career, and um, he, he has a really remarkable story. Hopefully that can be brought up to the podcast at some point. Oh, yeah. Even though boxers could compete in outside events, boxing events were still held in the prison, and these competitions often would occur with competition from other boxing clubs in the area that would come to the prison to compete against these inmates. These events, like the ones that were in the past, were much anticipated by the men in the prison who got to compete, as well as the many men who got to watch the event. The tradition of the comedy bout that I mentioned earlier was still around, but like many other aspects of the prison, it had also changed and evolved. Now it was held at halftime instead of at the beginning of the event, and it was almost always a group of men, that battle royale that we talked about earlier, and it was almost always having a quote-unquote free-for-all. 
still with some sort of gimmick like blindfolds or arms taped behind their backs, but almost always ending in a wrestling match on the ground with the entire audience laughing. <laughs> Naming themselves the Eastside Boxing Team, over the span of the next five years, the team boosted 70 inmate team members, with only 61 of those individuals who actually had a record of competing. And, of course, Sky can talk about this as well as me. That is a pretty high number for people competing involved in the sport. In most common, most boxing programs, there's only a few people who ever get those opportunities to compete. Among the most dedicated fighters, we had Jesse the General Garcia, Tommy <laughs> McFly, and Judy Kitchen. Of course, Ted Martinez and Monty Bryden were both Golden Glove champions well in prison. Then we have Larry Daughtry, who is not only the Golden Gloves champion, but also the Tri-State champion, Idaho, Utah, Montana. Tommy Reese had 107 fights, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. Even like, ooh, that is so many fights. Um, and he only ever lost three. Wow. He actually qualified as an alternative for the Olympics but could not attend because the warden would not pay his traveling expenses <laughs> oh. to go and fight. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh. Wow, what a story. I, would bet, that I, I bet he regretted his crime at that moment. Oh. Oh. Tommy, actually, at one point, the prison did fly him to Louisiana to fight. So the fact that they went that far, and that was actually the fight. He lost it, but he placed high enough that when that fighter got injured, he was selected as the alternative to go to the Olympics. Of course, that never ends up happening. Yeah. Downtown, I mean, they take you out of here to fight somewhere? Oh, yeah, I fought downtown. I fought in Pocatello, I fought in Salt Lake, I fought in New Orleans. From here? Uh -huh, from here. Warden Mason. Warden Mason, Charlie Banks and I on a plane to New Orleans to fight for the National Golden Glove Championship. Charlie Banks got beat by Ron Lyle, who later fought uh, George Foreman for the heavyweight championship of the world. And I got beat by, I fought five fights in two nights and got beat the, the last fight by some little black kid from Chicago. And he ended up an alternate for the Olympics and he got, he would have got to go to the Olympics, but he got killed. And if I could have got somebody to pay my way, I would have got to go to the 72 Olympics as an alternate in uh, the junior middleweight type and champions, and junior middleweight class. But Warden Mays, it was pretty decent about that. Guards would take us to Pocatello. They uh, took us, like, my, that's my hometown of Pocatello. Got to go down there, and it was pretty neat. They had big write-ups about me on the front page of the paper. And, you know, Not because I was so great, it's just because I was a good showman. You know, I was a good boxer, and I wasn't a knockout artist. I just put on a good show for everybody, because I went out there, and I, I loved boxing. I learned how to box. I learned how to stick and move, and, you know, and because uh, I had 112 fights. And only had, there was uh, 30, 37 of them by knockouts I won. And then I lost three fights. So I had a fairly decent record. Overall, the prison had at least seven matches inside the prison and 10 in other venues between 1969 and 1974. I gave an example earlier of an event in the prison, so I thought it would only be fair to show an event that took place outside of the prison. And this is an article from The Clock, October of 1973, the last year the prison was operational. And you can, you can see the change in how boxing is discussed and written about just in this article. Quote, the Eastside Boxing Gym held their tune-up bouts for the Golden Gloves on Saturday, the 28th of October, in the East Side Gym at the old site on Warm Springs Avenue. It was unusual in that, for the first time, outsiders and inmates sat together and viewed them. There were no disturbances and apparently no trouble. Perhaps we can have more of these in the future. Out of the 11 bouts, 10 of them were between the Eastsiders and the Vista Athletic Club and the Boise Exchange Club and the Marcin's Job Corps. A Marcin's coach, Henry Camille, is a show all by himself. Johnny Trurillo TKO Jeff Myers in the second round of the contest. It was obvious from the very first that it would be Johnny's fight, barring unforeseen accidents. Larry Ortego, this is the runner that we mentioned earlier, came out smoking in the first round, and at the end of the third, it was plain that he had it. He defeated John Miller on decision. Jesse, the ring general Garcia, 
handed Tom Burton of the Jobs Cur a very sound defeat. Jesse, who'd been out at Eagle Island for the last two months and had no chance for training out there, used a little of his ring know-how to beat the fellow from Mars. Wow. Undoubtedly, the most exciting fight of the evening was the heavyweight contest between our own Gary Baker, who weighed in at 182 pounds, which is typically the weight I fight at, and the Marcin's Job Corps, James Brown, who hit the scales at 192. Gary, who seemed at first to be a little in trouble, soon fought his way free, and in a minute 52 of the first round, he knocked Mr. Browning out. The east side crowd were on their feet, screaming when Gary began to make his move with a solid left hook to his midsection that set everything up for an overhand right. That was responsible for the knockout. Brown, who in the first few seconds had everything his way, was quite surprised when Gary put him down for the count. The Marcin crowd were screaming their support of their fighter quite right down when it became obvious that their boy was in trouble. Can you imagine having to compete and not having a chance to train? Jeez. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it raises the question, depending on where the prisoner is stationed, they may not get a lot of training. What does that entail, typically? So, um, it typically, modern training would entail uh, mitt work, bag work, um, conditioning, and sparring. Okay. And um, uh, the conditioning, um, obviously, would involve a lot of running, a lot of jump rope, a lot of strength training, uh, push-ups, pull-ups, squats, mm-hmm. stuff like that. In fact, it's almost more important for fighters to have stronger legs than upper body because your strength is more generated from your legs than your arms. Okay. In the Rocky movies, you always see Rocky running a, a thousand miles. You know, typically for amateur fighting and even a lot of pro fighting, it's actually more common for them to do sprints. Uh-huh just to kind of simulate that two minute round or three minute round um, as opposed to that like hour slow burn that you might get on a long run. The big thing, uh, you you do a lot of mitts and bag work, of course, but the big thing you do is sparring. And we know for a fact that the inmates here did a lot of sparring with each other. And truth be told, you actually will rack up a lot more brain damage from sparring than fights. Um, You know, sparring, you're going a lot lighter, you're, you're, it's your friends, you're taking care of each other, you're, you're, you're not going full power. But the thing with sparring is you do it a lot. Yeah. You, you, you spar round after round after round. And, you know, the fight, especially if you're fighting a three-round fight, is pretty short. Mm-hmm. And so the brain damage you take for that is pretty low. It's, it's the hours and hours of sparring beforehand. Leading up to my last fight, the six weeks prior to it, I, I got 120 rounds of sparring. Wow. Which, um, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. yes, it, it was a lot. And it was a lot of hard sparring, too. Of course, uh, this actually concludes the final era of fighting here in the pen uh, before we transfer to the new facility. Truthfully, my research has not extended past the old penitentiary, so I am unable to speak about the boxing program if it continued and when it was finally concluded. But boxing in the prison did have those three major eras that we discussed about through this podcast episode today during the hundred years of the prison's operation. In those years, we had 162 confirmed fighters and 31 fighting events that inmates were involved in. The ethics of boxing have always been up for debate. I think with any violent sport, but especially one as brutal as boxing, and I think the situation becomes even more complicated when you throw prisoners into the mix. Are we taking inmates and making them into even more hardened or perhaps even teaching them violent skills? Or is this giving them a violent outlet in order to work through some feelings and get through some aggression in a arguably safer environment. There are a lot of ways to look at this, and whether it's right or wrong, it's obvious that the sport meant a lot to a lot of the men here in the prison. That's something I can really understand because boxing has always been a big part of my life and has always meant a lot to me over the years. I could definitely see how someone who had everything else restricted and taken away from them would definitely cling on to this one distraction. I think that could go for any sport, and I think that's one of the reasons why sports were so important to men in in the correctional facility. Fitness is so important, and this 
I mean, the amount of things that you, you've just described yourself going through just this last month, I'm just, I'm impressed by the dedication and the self-discipline that goes along with this sport. It, man, the thrill of winning is probably, you probably live off of that for weeks. <laughs> well, and, and the devastation defeats. Oh, um, yeah. What, what it would feel like. I, I think about that a lot with the, the inmates just thinking about these fights, getting ready for these fights. And the one thing that gets talked about very rarely is how nervous people get before fights. Oh, um, I've ha- I've had fights in which I've been weighed in, made weight, going up to the ring, and, and the fight gets scratched. And the other fighters got too nervous and can't compete. Wow. And, um, you know, that's that's really common. It's 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 scary. Yeah. And and anyone who, who won't admit that is, is is not a serious fighter. Any fighter would tell you it's it's scary getting in the ring. It's scary being in front of, you know, hundreds of people cheering on you. A, lo- a lot of those people wanting you to get hurt, yeah, and wanting to see you shed some blood. It's it's a very intense moment, and it's a very um, your pride is kind of at stake in this oh, situation. That's a lot on the line. Well, and of course, with any sports, and, and any athlete can talk about this, um, any sport comes at a cost. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I mean, basketball players that have bad ankles, uh, you know, football players that, that have had neck damage. Um, you know, every sport comes at a cost. Boxing is a high cost. Yeah. And there is a sacrifice, there is a risk every time you go in the ring because... Bad things happen, injuries happen, and obviously um, the Association of Ringside Physicians do absolutely everything they can to make it as safe as possible. And boxing is one of the most regulated sports because of that. You know, we uh, have to get a yearly medical and then we get medically checked out before we go in and after we get checked out, after we get out of the ring. But despite that, um, it is still fighting and there is still a cost and a toll that your body will take. Awesome history. Um, So very, very well done. Well, first off, I do want to say this project did give me a lot of respect for um, what you two do on a regular basis, Um, especially when I was like searching specific inmates. Uh I don't think Mm -hmm. people who listen to the podcast who've never done historical research can even comprehend how much work you guys put into this. You guys do a lot of lot of work to make this podcast possible, and it's um it's truly amazing what you two have accomplished as researchers. So, oh, bravo to you two. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Also, I, I do need to give a shout out. Um, Camille and Ian both helped me so much with this project. Yeah. Uh, from tracking down articles, uh, Ian with the clock, as you can imagine, uh, the the two of them really. Really, if I published this, I would have to have their names as co-authors because um, the two of them put a lot of work into helping me with this. Well, you did a great job. And to put it all into into this nice, succinct history, like this is going to be a great resource for us. And I'm looking forward to having regular check-ins, you know, little bouts with Samuel, talking about some boxers here, talking about their history and We'll have to do another episode Zoom with you. Uh, I would love to talk about some of these inmates. Do you have background in, as a historian? I No, um, I actually got my degree in anthropology. Um, oh, okay. I should have probably mentioned earlier I've been working at the old penitentiary for about six months. It's been a tremendous amount of fun. It's, it's a great environment here. There's a lot of fun things going here. But no, uh, a lot of my research, um, my undergrad uh, research project was actually about um, abductions and supernatural claims. So a lot of my mm. research was um, on religion. And so that doesn't all transfer over. And, and um, once again, I, I this was kind of a learning curve. And I appreciate all of the coworkers uh, who, who helped show me how to do a little more of this like actual historical research as opposed to the scientific research. Yeah, if you've come to the old pen, especially on a weekend and gone to any of our presentations or our tours, you've probably taken one from Samuel here who picked it up immediately and just, you know, you ran with it, just carry your notebook around, asking questions all the time. It was great. And you are kind of a sponge for this history. So you've been so fun to work with. And yeah, I've been so excited to have you on the show. I appreciate, I appreciate that. It. I've I've tried to absorb as much as I can. Just shows like that dedication and determination like that you get from boxing and all your other achievements, you know, it translates over into how you've 
focus so hard on working as a historian, working as an interpreter here at the site. So Thank you. That. I, I do really appreciate that. So um, perhaps before we can conclude, um, I can end with a poem that an inmate actually oh, wrote. That sounds great. Joe Wright wrote an article about the importance of sports here for inmates. Uh, he published this in The Clock. And the in editorial arguing about why inmates need sports um, included a poem that he wrote himself. Well, this poem is not exclusively about boxing, I think it does do a great job of illustrating what the rest of the article was trying to say and the importance of sports and how much sports can matter for someone. Yeah. Here we go. It Happened on the Diamond by Joe Wright. It is easy to go at the start of the race with a free and swinging tread. You set yourself an easy pace as the whole race lies ahead. But when the goal is in sight and it's close to the final bell, then you must fight with all your might, for that is when class would tell. Well, Sam, we end every show with us saying, if I were to say, do your own time, how would you respond to that? I'll mix it up today. I'll say, uh, put your hands up and roll with the punches. I love it. (laughs) Nice. Very cool. All right, everybody, do your own time. Do your own number. We'll talk to you soon. If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Not only do we get to hear your feedback about the show, but it helps others find us as well. If you're interested in finding out more about the podcast and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, follow our Facebook group at Behind Gray Walls Podcast. We have a podcast Instagram as well. You can find us on Instagram at Behind Gray Walls Pod. So, what were we talking about? If I'd ever lost a fight, and I hadn't in here, but I, that's why I said I was really, really lucky, because I, there was guys that I did fight that sh- should have whipped my ass, and there was guys that were afraid of me to fight me that could have torn me every which way but loose, but I didn't act like that. <laughs> I acted like I was the, you know, but I didn't pick. I mean, I all my life I've been against bullies, so I never tried to pick on anybody, and I knew that you never backed anybody into a corner, and you always let somebody save face. You know, because the guys that I whipped their ass that I knew could whip me, but I'd hit them first. I'd, I'd hit them, I tried to hit them so many times first before they even knew it was coming. And so I, because I didn't want to get my ass whipped. But then I always let them save face. I always somehow, I, I made them feel that, you know, I was a little bit leery of them or, you know, I thought they were pretty tough or whatever. Because as long as you could let somebody save face, it, it, you weren't worried about them sneaking up behind your back or coming after you for revenge and stuff, you know.